In the 1950s, New Zealand was still very much tied to Mother England's apron strings. Where they went, we went, with a great deal of pomp and ceremony. In 1957, Britain began the largest ever series of nuclear tests in the Pacific. The Royal New Zealand Navy sent 551 sailors to help. They weren't told where they were going or why. Of those 551 men, only 160 are alive today. Many died in their 50s or younger. It was a journey into the unknown that would change the course of their lives forever. The thing was that we were professional navalmen and there was no qualms, you just had to go and uh, do the job, you know. The crew were very young, of course. I would have been 17. I think I was the youngest in the mess deck, actually. I was in the uh, communications mess, and I think I was the youngest in there. And I was commonly referred to as young Roy, so I guess I was, yeah. Everybody was young and fit. It was hard to believe that um, we weren't all going to live to a ripe old age. We had to be very fit in the Navy at that time. Well, I think they were young men who were very excited about doing something that was uh, interesting and new for them. They had no idea what they were going to be doing. They, I don't think they believed that they were going to be in any sort of danger at all. So in another sense, they were really quite ignorant about what was going to happen. March 1957. Two New Zealand Navy ships, the Pukaki and the Rotuiti, leave for Christmas Island in the Central Pacific. Leaving Auckland, we just quietly slipped out of harbour and we went without fanfare, obviously, because there were also some stirrings in New Zealand with regard to nuclear testing and that sort of thing. So they were trying to play that down as, as quietly as possible, and that was why the secrecy with the crew, of course. We had no idea what the exercise was going to be. Lots of speculation went around. The radar was being changed, modified, for obviously for a different purpose to ordinary gunnery. We didn't know why. Early March we sailed, and only then did we know that we were going to participate in British hydrogen bomb tests. And we thought, that's very, very, very exciting. It was a big adventure to us. We thought, oh, you know, this is great. We're going to see some big bombs going off. Being away, going away from New Zealand, majority, well, I think all of us uh, in our class anyway, it was our first time out of New Zealand, which was exciting enough, but we going in to take part in something like bomb testing. We thought, well, that wasn't too bad at all. In an operation codename Grapple, the New Zealanders were to join forces with thousands of British servicemen already based on Christmas Island, one of 30 coral atolls in what is now known as Kiribati. It was a massive undertaking, with vehicles, equipment and supplies shipped in from England, and runways, roads and accommodation being built from scratch. For the small indigenous population who'd already hosted the American military during World War II, there must have been a strange sense of deja vu. Now, worried by the Soviet Union's nuclear capabilities, Britain wanted to prove that it too had a potent nuclear arsenal. But with an impending international ban on atmospheric testing, it was a race against time. To prepare for their mission, the men were shown the latest instructional films on the subject. There is another element new to warfare, nuclear radiations. Note that nuclear radiations cannot be detected by any of the human senses. Their presence and intensity can only be detected by sensitive instruments. <laughs> I mean, it frightened you even more. <laughs> they were turned out by the Admiralty in, in, the, in the UK and um, made specifically for us. And of course, they gave you reassuring shots of arrows which were meant to be radiation wiggling through the ship. <laughs> we were given some basic lectures on nuclear physics, which went over just about everybody's head. Even the chap that delivered them didn't really know what he was talking about, so nobody worried much. We thought we'll leave that until the boffins, they can worry about that. We'll just do our jobs, whatever they are. The New Zealand Navy's official purpose at the test site was to monitor the weather. Hydrogen balloons were launched high into the atmosphere to collect data, but the men would soon be watching a lot more than the weather. Britain's Ministry of Defence has always claimed that personnel at risk from radiation were properly protected but many were issued with just denim shirts, gloves and cotton balaclavas. Woefully inadequate by today's standards. We had an additional for this witnessing these detonations, which was really only a pair of dark goggles, which was to protect the eyes from the flash. It became obvious that 
when we were to be present at these detonations, that they wanted as many of the crew on deck as possible. And the ship would be run with skeleton crew. The rest had to be on deck. By May the 15th, preparations were complete. A valiant aircraft was loaded with a hydrogen bomb thousands of times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We could see the bomber from quite a long distance away and the captain was keeping us informed. Before the first detonation, yeah, there was a bit of anxiety. There was no two ways about that on board. And we, we were anxious. I mean, we, we never, we had no, no idea, no concept of what we were going to see. And the only impressions that we had beforehand were, were photographs and books of the atomic explosions over Nagasaki and Hiroshima. On decks in the forward area, observers dressed in protective clothing awaited the sight of the van. We had our backs to the detonation. We were given a count up, put our hands over our eyes. As the aircraft approached, we had on loudspeaker the pilot giving a commentary. Minus 10 seconds, 202, steady, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, now, one Flash. You know, although I had my eyes behind those dark glasses and possibly closed and my hands over them, the light from that actually came right through my hands, through my glasses. And f just for an instant, there was an X-ray view of um, my hands pink with the bones there. And that really sort of shook me. After 10 seconds, we were told to stand and face the fireball as it formed and watch it, and that was a, a most impressive sight. And then this thing emerged, appear, appearing to emerge from the sea, but in fact drawing seawater up as it formed its stalk. And it was a monstrous looking thing. It was out of all proportion to its surroundings, and it was a, a convoluted mass of surging, throbbing, roaring cloud. Well, Janet, I'm afraid I couldn't explain the bomb to you. Nobody could. You'd have to see it to see what a marvellous sight, but at the same time terrifying. Brother, what a weapon. It was equivalent to 20 million tonnes of TNT. Some cracker, eh? Although the men had been told they'd be 200 miles away from the detonation point, the Pukaki was only 80 miles away. During later blasts, they were as close as 20 miles from ground zero. The next thing that surprised me was helicopters diving in and out of the mushroom cloud, picking up samples, which I didn't think was a very good idea. And, and that's when I first thought that it must be dangerous for such things to happen. But I've heard since that all those helicopter people, that uh, they've all actually died. I don't think there are any left at all. As they watched the mushroom cloud from the deck, the men thought it was all over but they were in for another surprise. I saw the, the bow being pointed towards this cloud, which was then the normal mushroom shape, and I didn't pay too much attention at first because I didn't think we'd be going that way. And I went and resumed my duties in the, in the wireless office, and they had a gyro compass in there that gives the um, ship's course and never altered. And it then became obvious that we were going to go through ground zero, or very close to it. The practice of travelling towards the test site after an explosion would become all too common. Sometimes the New Zealanders were ordered to rig hydrophonic equipment directly under Ground Zero and to return for it afterwards. The Brits wanted the sounds, the underwater sounds, prior to the bomb detonating and immediately after, or during and after. And they actually came out very, very well. And the boat's crew in their shorts and sandals rode off to go and retrieve the dinghy. And this is an hour and a half or so after that detonation. The cloud was still sitting up there. And of these seven blokes in this boat, you know, the coxswain is alive, but he's had his rough times. The rest of the blokes have all passed on. I thought about it while we were setting it up. And I thought, I don't like this very much. And I think I'll skid out of this if I can. But I, I felt that I was probably being over-concerned about it. If I thought if nobody else was concerned, why am I? But I'm sure other people were concerned, but they put their fears aside and left their, their trust in the powers that be, and uh, they paid a severe penalty for it.
Zealand's rolling hills must have seemed a long way from the arms race in the Cold War. But back in the 50s, we couldn't afford to say no. Well, in the mid-1950s, New Zealand had a really close relationship with Britain. Uh, economically, Britain took the majority of our exports. Personally, a lot of people had uh, relatives in the United Kingdom, of course, and it's only 10 years after the end of the F Second World War. So it's a very close emotional relationship. We had a close defence relationship. And, of course, it's only, when you think about it, 1953-54, you've got the royal tour and absolutely amazing scenes of patri patriotic excitement and so on in, in New Zealand. The British were relying heavily on that patriotism and goodwill. Another ally, Australia, had already refused to help. After seeing the damage caused by two earlier blasts at Maralinga and the Montebello Islands, the Australian government told the British to look elsewhere for a test site. Look elsewhere, they did, straight across the Tasman. Britain asked Prime Minister Sidney Holland if it could use the Kermadec Islands, less than a thousand kilometres from Auckland. When push came to shove, they were, there were definite limits to what New Zealand was prepared to do. And I think this clearly shown with the request to use the Kermadec as a testing site. And there, Prime Minister Holland basically said, the political consequences for me of such an agreeing to that would be too serious and it's just not acceptable. So they, they were keen to help, but there were limits on their willingness to do so. The British went back to their maps and picked one of their own territories, Christmas Island, 4,000 kilometres away in the central Pacific. This time, Prime Minister Holland pledged New Zealand's full support. At the time, I'm confident, in fact, I'm very sure, that both the New Zealand's political leaders and the, our most senior military officers thought that the uh, personnel involved in the testing programme were not exposed to any real danger at all. But the politicians' confidence wasn't universally shared. By 1958, some of the men had witnessed as many as nine blasts, and concern about the safety of nuclear weapons was growing worldwide. In Britain, thousands took to the streets, marching 80 kilometres from London to the atomic weapons facility at Aldenaston. Those protests inspired a growing number of anti-nuclear activists in New Zealand. The Aldermaston marches were so huge, it was just amazing. And they walked for they walked for two or three days. I became the general secretary for the campaign for nuclear disarmament for the whole of New Zealand, and we did have some very strong and interesting people who helped, particularly my dearest friend Elsie Locke. We felt that one of our roles was a, it sounds a bit um, superior, but we we thought that to educate people about the actual facts were was very important. Like everybody involved in the campaign, they did really put their public image at risk. The devastation at Hiroshima and Nagasaki more than a decade earlier had shown the world the destructive power of nuclear bombs. Even then, scientists had warned of the long-term effects of radiation exposure. In atom war, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. As the British government planned its nuclear tests in the Pacific, several scientists sent letters to the Ministry of Defence about the possible dangers to the servicemen and their future offspring. Reports from Japan had already linked radiation exposure to increased rates of leukaemia. But there's evidence that the Ministry intended to expose servicemen to radiation deliberately. They wanted to monitor its effects on men in nuclear combat, as this letter from the Ministry to the Army suggests. The Army must cover the detailed effects of various types of explosion on equipment, stores and men with and without various types of protection. These servicemen were to be nuclear guinea pigs. Scientists are still debating the issue today. At the University of Manchester, Philip Day is convinced the dangers were known at the time. They certainly knew there were risks. I mean, this was 57, 58. Now, the plutonium for those bombs was actually produced um, at Windscale, which is um, in Great Britain, in Cumbria, and uh, was produced in two reactors, which started in 1950, and uh, one of them caught fire in 1957, and the reactors were closed at that time. Um, but subsequent to the fire, a lot of precautions were taken uh, to measure radioactive fallout 
over Britain, milk was removed from the market, the sheep were taken off the market because uh, of contamination of meat, a lot of flexible products were removed. So people did know that you could have fallout and that it would be dangerous if you did. But the British Ministry of Defence has always denied that the men at Christmas Island were exposed to any radiation risks. It's a view shared by Andrew McEwan, leading nuclear physicist and author of Nuclear New Zealand, Sorting Fact from Fiction. For a thermal nuclear weapon detonated at a mile above the surface, there is very little in the way of induced radioactivity from neutrons and the fission products that are produced start to rise with a fireball very rapidly. So that after 10 minutes or so, most of the radioactive material has actually gone to an altitude of about 20 miles. So it's not local, it's not near the surface, and then it becomes dispersed very widely right around the globe. Just looking at what might happen after an explosion, the, uh, the cloud is carried to an enormous hut by the, by the fireball and the heat. Um, and some of it disperses right around the world, but quite a lot of it falls out in the, in the neighbourhood, particularly if it rains. And uh, in that part of the world, you get tropical rainstorms quite frequently. And this brings down the radioactive material. And this is well known, and it happens, it happens the world over, and no one would really dispute that. So I don't understand how anyone could say that there was no possibility of contamination, because it's just obvious to anyone with the remotest understanding of, of how all this goes, about, goes on, um, that there would have been contamination. We uh, made our own water on the ship, uh, fresh water, and we ran out of water. So the captain decided he would look for some rain clouds and he found one, steamed straight underneath it, and we all rushed up on deck, their soap and towels, and had a shower, fresh air. Out of nowhere, we would get a downpour around five o'clock in the evening. We went ashore, I mean, we were anchored off Christmas Island, we went ashore in Liberty Boats, and then we ran from the jetty to the canteen in, in the rainstorm, and we would have had nothing more than shorts and sandals on. And we'd get drenched, but it didn't matter because we were dry in minutes. And then we indulge in the British beers till it's time to go back to the ship. Now they have quite a range of anecdotal evidence which would lead them to believe that they have been exposed in different ways. And clearly they're looking for some recognition. Nuclear explosions are events which are awesome, traumatic, and just the visual and audible effects would, might lead them to believe that something desperate is going on. However, there is no evidence, in fact, that they were exposed to radiation. It is interesting to record that no one suffered by contamination and that no single item of equipment sustained unforeseen effects. The ministry claimed that radiation levels near the test site were measured constantly and that only small traces of contamination were ever found. Their measuring devices were early Geiger counters, which many scientists now regard as inadequate. The, the standard um, radiation detection Geiger counter unit that I got, the military one, is extraordinarily, uh, what's the word, you know, um, feeble. I mean, it just, it, 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 you, need to, you need to really more or less blow a bomb off in front of it to get it to detect anything at all, you know. The other problem with Geiger counters is that they only measure gamma radiation. Alpha and beta radiation types are more harmful, but they were not measured. Just one particle of strontium-90 or plutonium could contain enough radioactivity to cause cancer 10, 20 or even 50 years on. The men played cricket, swam, caught and ate fish in blissful ignorance of this fallout. They didn't know it, but they were playing a deadly waiting game. Ross Sefton loves his music. On a good day, he still jams with his mates. But like many nuclear test veterans, he's suffered a long and debilitating illness. An illness that put a stop to his drumming and halted his growing reputation as a landscape artist. He's seen many of his shipmates die young from cancer and other illnesses. As time went on through my 20s, I was developing fatigue. I felt very tired, much easier. Pains, joint pains, stiff necks, stiff joints. By the time I was 30, and I was looking at signing on for another eight years at the Navy, which would have taken me through to 38. I knew then that I'd never do it in the condition that I was in, and I left. And what actually happened then was a, an onslaught of severe muscular and, and um, 
skeletal problems that nobody could sort of explain, which got worse and worse. I was in severe pain all the time and couldn't move across the room, couldn't get out of a chair, I couldn't get, get my arm to my face to, to drink. Suffering for the past four decades, Roy has kept his illness under control with constant medication, up to 20 tablets a day. It was really difficult. I used to ask the doctor if there's anything they can do, and they just didn't know what, what it was that he had. And um, it's awful watching somebody that you marry have a lot of pain and not be able to do anything about it. I still have very bad periods where I am quite ill and um, I take to the bed and I may be there for three weeks or something, but people don't see that. And, um, six weeks. Six weeks at times, yeah. Was, um... Peter Asma is dying of multiple myeloma, a bone marrow cancer that ultimately attacks the immune system. One of the known causes is exposure to radiation. It's, uh, well, a death sentence, really, because um, the body can't fight off any infections that come into it. Peter has blood tests every week and frequent transfusions. While I'm having treatment, it's even worse because of the side effects of the treatment, and that makes you tired, lethargic, and, um, and you just feel lousy all the time. I have to keep mainly to myself and only venture out when I need to for groceries and that sort of thing because I have a low immune system, so I can't go out where I can pick up bugs and that sort of thing. So I virtually have to stick to myself and stay around the house and, um, yeah, be on my own. This one tells my story of what happened to me in my mid-50s. I broke out in what was thought to be psoriasis, chronic psoriasis, along with some 45, 46 other blokes of all skin types. Paul has the top layer of his skin burnt off every three months. It's the only treatment that's worked. But it wasn't until I was sent to the dermatologist, he said, this is a virulent form of skin cancer. It's a very rare and unusual form of skin cancer. He said, I think you're only just in time. If that gets inside, that's the finish. Three years after the tests, aged 33, Arthur Venus had a brain hemorrhage. And like many veterans, he also developed cataracts at an early age. This too has been linked to radiation exposure. The first time that, that I realised anything was wrong was my wife kept telling me that, um, that I was driving too close to the lampposts. <laughs> because, and then the next time, um, when my right eye went, um, it was because I was driving too far over the other side of the road. Ruth Mackenzie's husband, Roy, was the Pukaki's padre. He was fit and healthy before the tests, but died in his early 60s of premature ageing of the heart, another recognised symptom of radiation exposure. Not only that, but two out of three of his and Ruth's children were born with genetic abnormalities. If you have two serious things wrong with two children, you want to know what's gone wrong. Their first son, Bruce, has Asperger's syndrome and chronic fatigue. Their daughter, Fiona, was born with a potentially fatal heart condition known as Fallows Tetralogy and underwent surgery at the age of three. I was well aware of the outcome of surgeries for Fallows and sometimes they weren't good outcomes. So it was quite a frightening time. Her surgery was long, but when she came back, she was no longer purple. The first thing I saw her were her pink ears. We never ever connected the loss of two of our children with nuclear radiation at all. It never ever entered our minds that one that was stillborn and, and the other one died at five months old. And our son, who was born with an incomplete esophagus, who's had a major operation where they removed ribs and all sorts of things. These sort of things hadn't been brought out into the open. It's for the children coming on is really what I wonder about, you know? Will there be anything going through for them, like? Suspicious about her husband's early death and her children's illnesses, Ruth went looking for answers. With her daughter's help, she conducted extensive research into the health of the veterans and their families. Organs malformed. 
Of the children conceived after the test, one and two entered in miscarriage or stillbirth. Of those that survived, 50% were born with a genetic abnormality, compared with just 2.5% in the general population. 75% of the men have suffered cancer, and most have died in their 50s. We found that far more of our fellows had died. You have to understand that these were very healthy young men. Some of them were only boys of 16, and they were cream of New Zealand's crop. If there was anything wrong with them, they'd never have been in the Navy. Six of them died in their 20s, six in their 30s. I think it was 43 in their 40s. And so it went on until it came to a peak in about the 30, 30 years after the bomb. And this is exactly what they found in Britain too. Holland Hart. Ruth sent her findings to British researcher Sue Rabbit Roth of Dundee University, who added them to her own extensive studies of the British Christmas Island veterans. The important and sad thing, of course, was that the pattern of illnesses was very similar in the two different groups, as it subsequently proved to be for the Fijian men who were sending us information to. What they seemed to be telling us was that there was far too much cancer in the men, that the cancer was of particular types which cluster under the radiogenic types of cancer, ones that can be caused by radiation. There was a, a next level of illness where men had illnesses which were very hard to define and which their doctors didn't always really understand or even empathise with. The men would say, I've got crumbling bones, I feel as though my body's falling apart. They would become unemployable in their late 40s, early 50s. Many of the men also, apart from these musculoskeletal problems, they had skin problems. And you might think, well, if you send Brits out to the South Pacific without adequate sun protection, or even New Zealanders perhaps, they're going to come down with skin conditions as a consequence of extreme sunburn. But what we found when we obtained information from the Fijian men who were present was that they too suffered skin problems. You have marked infertility in some of the men. Sometimes it repairs itself, but other times it doesn't. Again, well known, known well before the men were sent to the tests that all these hazards could occur if individuals were exposed to radiation. By the 1990s, the veterans were convinced that their health problems and those of their children were due to radiation exposure. Frustrated at a total lack of recognition and health studies that ignored crucial evidence, they formed the New Zealand Nuclear Test Veterans Association. After having fought a long and hard battle for the right to war pensions and research funding, they sought legal advice. Veterans Association Chairman Roy Sefton approached New Zealand lawyer Gordon Payne. Gordon, how are you again? He suggested that there was a case against the British government. The veterans have joined a huge multi-class action against the British MOD, along with the UK and Fijian grapple veterans. It is well underway. It seems clear to me, reading the material that I have, that the effects of radiation on people were known to the British government prior to this test. And early in the 50s, they knew. And it seemed that the British government really did want to know how far away from a nuclear blast they could have fighting men. There was no if like informed consent for any of these servicemen. They weren't told, you're going to a dangerous situation, you could be irrevocably harmed. It does seem to me that there is a possibility, and I'd rate it higher than just a mere possibility, what was happening was an experiment that the British government wanted to know how close the bomb could be dropped with men being there. They were guinea pigs. I remember reading somewhere an old expression, if you can see the mushroom cloud, you're too close. Yet there is a very famous picture taken from the uh, deck of one of the ships which shows the mushroom cloud and then the ship proceeded to steam through ground zero. Now that's not a caring government saying well we want you to observe what happens to atmospheric conditions. That's a, a government rather more cynically saying while you're observing the atmospheric conditions we'll be observing you. Unlike Britain, in 1998 the United States agreed to compensate any of its new test veterans who had developed any one of 15 different types of cancer. There was no obligation to prove that the cancers were caused by radiation exposure. The mere fact that the men had been at the tests was enough. 
The scientific evidence to support the veteran's case was becoming stronger all the time and would only get stronger still. What is becoming very clear as a result of the research we've done around Chernobyl is that actually um, genetic damage of this sort from low-level radiation has effects across the whole spectrum of health, every single thing. So you have effects from rheumatoid arthritis to, to, to bad teeth to stomach ulcers to autoimmune diseases. Um, it generally, it could be considered to be premature ageing. In fact, we've got children in the Chernobyl-affected territories and they have tissue... Um, uh, ageing effects uh, such that, that a child of say 16 years has got a st stomach of a 65 year old. Uh, these children of 9, 10, 11 are dying of heart attacks. They're suffering from, from uh, cardiac arrhythmias and all the diseases that you see in older people because of the genetic damage, that the, what we call somatic da genetic damage, that's genetic damage to individual somatic cells in the body. And research into genetic damage is likely to help the veterans case. As we unlock the mysteries of DNA, so we're able to pinpoint the toxins that can harm us. After much lobbying, the New Zealand veterans were granted $200,000 by the government and are using it to fund groundbreaking research. Dr. L. Rowland and his team at Massey University are analysing blood samples from the veterans and comparing them with a carefully selected control group to see whether there is greater DNA damage in the veterans' chromosomes. If there is, it will suggest that the veterans have been exposed to something harmful as a group. The most likely cause of that harm, exposure to radiation. When people have been exposed to radiation, the, the two long-term effects that uh, are most common uh, are effects to the eyes or to the genetic material, to the DNA. In terms of the genetic material, radiation pulverises DNA, breaks it up. Um, if the veterans had uh, suffered a massive dose, they wouldn't be here today. What we're looking at is the possibility of very low dosages uh, that may have uh, had a long-term effect. And we can actually let the world know the results of the study then. Yes, by then... Roy is hopeful that if the scientists' findings are positive, they will add weight to the veterans' claim against the British Ministry of Defence. I've got the rest of them. Oh, great. Yeah, I know. Guess who's going to get caught with them? I am. Well, yes. be taken, because if anybody's going to end up off in, the distance. in a Thai jail for smuggling drugs, it'll be you, my dear. Thank you very much. Back at home, Roy and his wife Joan prepare to leave for the UK. The veterans' British lawyers have advised Roy that the Minister of Defence has been served notice of their intention to sue and must respond imminently. Either settle out of court or proceed to trial. As the case reaches ahead, he is going to represent the New Zealanders' interests in London. There are different issues that we have with regard to our exposure and duties, as opposed to the, um, the English and the Fijian vets, actually. One good example is that, on average, per man, we were exposed to more detonations than any of the other Commonwealth services. So that's a thing that we really need to put home to to make the argument for our case. Do you need your tickets? No, no you hang on to them for me. Keep them together, Joan. OK. It's going to go either two ways, I think. The, the, the British will either relent and say it's not worth going through all this hassle and exposing ourselves to the world media, or they could go the other way and say, well, um, we will fight it bitterly to the end. The best possible outcome would, while I was over there, that the British government would say, look, we don't want to be bothered with a court case. Why don't we sit down now and talk about it and see if we can come to some arrangement to settle this long-held grievance? Now, look at husband's there. Oh, <laughs> oh hasn't he aged? <laughs> it's, it's not the money, really, of importance. The important thing to us, really, is a form of acknowledgement from the government of the UK that uh, they were responsible for a lot of the grief and misery that they have caused through their testing program. That's a lot to ask, actually. Portsmouth, England, historic home of the Royal Navy, where many of the British servicemen began their ill-fated journey to Christmas Island. Roy is meeting up with some of the British nuclear test veterans, including Richard, who served briefly on the Rotuiti. They're all closed. I'd, I'd hate to do any of the spies in there, Roy. I wouldn't even want to go up there. The Brits have similar stories to the New Zealanders. Well, I'm going to have to go down there and see if I can get a hold of the Brits. Yeah, I'm going to have to go down there and see if I can get a hold of the Brits. Yeah, I'm going to have to go down there and see if I can get a hold of the Brits.
I mean, I thought I was going to go on cruise, you know, in the South Sea Islands with all the hula hula girls and everything, but no, we got we got H bombs instead, don't we? we got <laughs> Our government has maintained all along that there was nothing to worry about exploding H-bombs. If that was the case, why did they go out into the middle of the Pacific to explode them on little islands away? Why didn't they explode them off land's end? We just feel that basically they've swept us under the carpet and um, we've got no alternative in the finish but to take them to court. And if we lose that, well, we're not so getting what? no younger, are we, John? We're not getting any younger, are we? Well, <laughs> we're speak all for yourself. Knocking <laughs> on to 70. The other thing, to be perfectly honest, is that we feel that we should never have been sent there in the first place. Was it really necessary to have 3,600 men stationed within 25 miles of the deaths? Why did they need all those people there? Because you don't get any answers to these questions. They just keep on, as I said, sweeping you under the carpet. Roy and Joan have been invited to Portsmouth Cathedral to represent the New Zealand Grapple veterans at a British veterans memorial service. These lads, and they were lads, 17, 18, 19, national servicemen, were participating in what seemed to be a great adventure. The injustice comes that it wasn't very long before some of them began to get really very distressing medical symptoms. Of course now we know a lot more about radioactivity, there's been huge compensation paid to people in power stations, nuclear submarines and so on who've been accidentally exposed. These lads got nothing. The first injustice is that they were serving the forces of the Crown and they were neglected and overlooked. The second is of course that radioactivity is so insidious that there are now effects in children and grandchildren. We owe them something, and we ought to pay it. Roy and the British veterans meet, but there's bad news. Everybody had to be 35 nautical miles away. The funding they rely on from the British Legal Services Commission, similar to Legal Aid in New Zealand, is in grave doubt. Without this, it will be impossible for the veterans to proceed with their court action. I'd love to be optimistic. I am so frustrated after two years that I cannot be optimistic. They have done everything possible, the Legal Services Commission, so far not to fund it. It's a good case, I think it should go forward, and I think it's winnable, and these people deserve compensation. Compensation seems a long way off. The government has been given extra time to review the evidence. Combined with the doubt over legal aid, Roy is left wondering if these are deliberate stalling tactics. The problem we have is time, and the problem with time is not that we're just dying. The veterans and the widows themselves are getting much older. You need a, a very clear mind sometimes to sort through these things, and when people are sick, uh, aged and becoming sick, the will becomes less, and that's the problem that, that, that we have, really. Time is, is, is the problem, and I might say we're not the only people that realise that time is the problem. Um, Possibly the uh, government of the UK and the Ministry of Defence and the Legal Services Commission also do. Roy leaves England with the case hanging in the balance. Back in New Zealand, he returns to Massey University to learn the first results from the genetic study. Good morning, Roy. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you again. You. Well, we have some interesting results. This is a veteran, and this is the sort of thing we've been observing. The interesting thing to look at here is that there's been a translocation of chromosome 15 onto chromosome 2, and chromosome 2 is broken and there's a fragment from the right here. There's a, a correlation between uh, translocations and, uh, and ill health that's been well established. When we look at the data we've gathered and, and compare the controls with the nuclear test veterans, we are detecting a small but nevertheless significant effect of genetic damage in the, in the nuclear test veterans. In this particular case, the results look, do look interesting in seeming to indicate that there is a level of genetic damage in the veterans that could be explained only by the fact that they, they took part in Operation Grapple. Scientific evidence may be falling in veterans' favour, but it's not enough. The Legal Services Commission has just announced a final withdrawal of all funding for the veterans. These men are being denied the right to be heard by the very same government that sent them, and their children, so innocently caught up in the fallout, may be denied recompense.
But for the survivors of Christmas Island, the fight will continue. What can you do? Apart from stay alive until the British government decide to give us compensation. If they ever do. <laughs> but they're probably waiting for the last man standing. Yeah, I, I do have a do have a certain amount of anger um, about the whole thing now because um, successive governments, um, <clears throat> whether it be national or Labour, um, initially disbelieved that that anything would happen to, to, to the people that went that went there. Um, whether they they did that at the behest of the British government, I don't know. Uh, but but nevertheless, um, you know, it, it's just the continual disbelief that such things could happen. I don't know how much the New Zealand government knew. I know perfectly well that the British government knew. And they used our men without their permission, without their parents' permission when they were only 16, and possibly without their superiors' permission, and they used them. We went off to serve our country and we knew very well what war was like because we were brought up as children during the Second World War. Um, but to realise later, and even when we were up there, we felt that we were sort of being used. There was that feeling that you just couldn't put your finger on, but you knew, you knew it wasn't right. And to look back and think, well, if they had done things a little differently um, and been a little more caring, um, then a lot of grief and pain um, would have been avoided. There's no two ways about that. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.